everyone. Thank you for joining me today. My name is Rose Hurwitz, uh, and I'm a Pulitzer nominated journalist and the founder of Woman to Follow. I'm very honored to have my guest with me tonight, uh, Dr. Monica McClure, and we will meet her shortly. Um, before that, I want to thank my terrific producer, Stefan Kaplan. Uh, you can find him at Spinach, Spin, I'm sorry, you can find him at uh, Spinach Social on Twitter. Uh, I also want to thank my sponsor for the show, uh, Women in Technology, or Witty. So uh, I hope uh, you will send me any questions or comments you might have. Uh, it should be an important discussion. Um, uh, so please join us uh, on Facebook, on Twitter at Rose Horowitz 31 or on my Woman to Follow channel. Uh, my guest today is uh, trailblazer Monica McLemore, McLemore, a professor, nurse, and activist. Uh, Dr. McLemore has been a leader in researching reproductive rights, health, and justice throughout her long career. Before I start, though, um, I want to uh, talk about, just acknowledge, um, to note the har horrible shooting in Texas, uh, which comes on the heels of racially, uh, racially motivated uh, shooting we saw in, in Buffalo last week. Uh, we clearly have a problem to fix that is long overdue for us to fix, and that has, has not uh, been fixed for so many years. Uh, my kids were, uh, I live in Connecticut, my kids were in school when Sandy Hook happened. Um, their classes went on lockdown. It was very frightening. So uh, it's just a terrible pain um, for the families in Texas, for the families in Buffalo, and uh, for us all who witnessed this uh, terrible tragedy. Uh, I'll talk, I'll introduce uh, Dr. McMore a little bit more uh, if she will join me. So, hi. Hi, Rose. How you doing? I'm good. How are you? I'm okay. It's a somber day, um, and I really appreciate the shout out uh, specific to the families who have to deal with gun violence. So, thank you. <clears throat> uh, my honor to have you here. I'll just tell everybody a little bit about more, a little more about you. Uh, uh, let's see. Just want to get this right. You have so many credentials. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, so you are a tenured professor at the University of California, San Francisco, and uh, you were named the Thelma Show Shobe, is that the right? Oh. Uh, okay. Uh, endowed chair in 2021. Uh, and you have 28 years of experience as a clinical nurse. Um, this fall, you will become a tenured professor in the Child, Family, and Population Health Department at the University of Washington School of Nursing. Uh, your research has been cited in five amicus briefs to the Supreme Court, and your work has appeared in many publications, including Scientific American, uh, Day Magazine, and ProPublica NPR. Uh, Dr. McLemore earned a bachelor's degree in nursing from the College of New Jersey. Uh, and she holds a master's of public health from San Francisco State University and a PhD in oncology genomics from the University of California in San Francisco. Welcome. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. <clears throat> so, you know, I, first of all, I love your show and I'm really glad uh, that I have an opportunity to, you know, talk about like so many things specific to my work, so many things that are very timely right now. I mean, I have to tell you, I I would be remiss not to say two things uh, specific to what you said about gun violence. And I really want to link this together for listeners to understand why gun violence, voting rights, a whole variety of things are reproductive justice issues. My dad grew up in Buffalo. He was born in Fort Worth, Texas, but he, he grew up in Buffalo, New York. And my grandmother lived there for most of her adult life and she was 94 years old when she died. So for me, you know, I, I know that grocery store where those black people were murdered. Yeah. Um, and then when you talked about Sandy Hook, my dissertation defense anniversary is on December 14th. So Sandy Hook is emblazed into my brain because that was the day, you know, children died at school. And right. I also like to tell people that that was probably the day that gun reform died in the United States because we have seen school shootings 
beyond Sandy Hook. I mean, I'm old enough to remember when we had Columbine, right? right. Yeah. So, you know, for me, Black women have been talking about this and we have data around this. In fact, we have two papers that just came out about this in terms of the fear that Black mothers face around police violence. I mean, we're, we're not even talking about unarmed shootings of Black Americans like Amon Aubrey or George Floyd or Breonna Taylor, right? I mean, these are school shootings. So gun violence is a reproductive justice issue, not just from police shootings and gun violence, but gun violence, period, regardless of whoever the shooter is. Because on the one hand, as we've all seen, it limits the opportunity for individuals to advance or finish their education. It creates an environment and situation where now you can be shot anywhere. You can be shot at a grocery store, a movie theater, school, right? And so we've created a situation where people's capacity to reproduce is limited out of worry and fear. But then when they do decide to be courageous enough to become parents and to want to be able to propagate our species and bring new people, new humans into the world, they have to worry about whether or not they're going to be shot. Right? So when we think through reproductive justice, I'm going to define what I mean by that in a minute. <laughs> when we think about like what it means to exist as a human, you want to be safe from violence from any individual or from any government or state. Right. We could even bring in, you know, what's going on the war in Ukraine. Right. Why is gun violence a reproductive justice issue? Because the second tenet of, of reproductive justice, and I'm going to define it now. There are four uh, in the ways that I think about reproductive justice. So reproductive health is health services provision. What I did for 28 years clinically right now, the clinical work that I do, COVID-19 vaccines and flu shots. Right. That is reproductive health when you're providing health care to an individual. Reproductive rights, the legal protections that we as citizens hope that our courts, you know, and judges will protect. That's a really different construct, right? Those legal protections that we think about versus reproductive health when you're seeking reproductive health care, right? You need a pap smear. You need to be tested for sexually transmitted infections. You're going to go to your mammogram and have your breast screen, right? That's reproductive health, reproductive rights, legal protections. We're waiting for a new case from the Supreme Court, right? That's right. Reproductive justice is different and more comprehensive than both of those two things. Reproductive, they, justice, reproductive, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, reproductive <laughs> justice posits that everybody has a human right. And because reproductive justice is a combination of uh, reproductive health and rights with social justice. That's where the name comes from, right? So 12 Black women got together and coined the term reproductive justice because they realized that the terms choice and autonomy did not encompass the experience of Black, Latinx, and Indigenous, and other people of color and queer folk, disabled individuals. So they wanted a more comprehensive way for us to be able to talk about what we as citizens should be able to expect. So reproductive justice sits in a human rights frame and it posits that every person has a human right to make family, to birth, to become pregnant, and to be able to have those experiences in the ways that they uh, would like to and in a, in a res with respect and dignity, and that they will have all the support that they need in order to be able to do that. That's the first tenet of reproductive justice. The second tenet of reproductive justice states that People have the human right to prevent, end uh, any pregnancies with, again, the supports and the dignity that they need in order to be able to make that happen. The third tenet of reproductive justice means that we have the human right to parent the children we already have in safe environments, free from any violence from an individual or any government or state. And the fourth tenet of reproductive justice is that we all have a human right to disassociate sex from reproduction. And that allows us to have conversations about healthy sexuality and pleasure, infertility, uh, surrogacy. It gives us consent. It gives us an opportunity to have different conversations. So those are the four tenets grounded in human rights. Thank you. Thank you for that, really. Um, lengthy, well, not lengthy, but a really good explanation. I'm trying to remember all the tenets as we speak, but I guess one question I would ask you, 
uh, as a journalist is uh, how how mainstream is this view? How many people, you know, mm -hmm. understand what reproductive yeah. justice is? And, yeah. uh, you know, what is the media or the mainstream media getting missing when they talk yeah. about reproduction? Re reproductive well, justice? if we want a short primer, uh, the Sister Song Reproductive Justice Collective, they, the way they talk about it is you have a right to birth, you have a right to abortion, you have a right to parent children in safe communities and environments and have all the supports you need to do all three. That's the simple way to think about it. As a scholar and a scientist though, reproductive justice is a theory, it's a praxis, it's an advocacy strategy, it's an organizing strategy. So depending on who you talk to, um, you will, some people will say we've gotten some very good coverage of reproductive justice. Why? Well, because Stacey Abrams said it at the <laughs> you know, uh, State of the Union, right? We've heard the vice president use this language. We've heard the president use this language. We've heard the Congressional Black Caucus use this language. And we've heard, you know, the proponents uh, of the Momnibus and Build Back Better use this language. So from a policy perspective, one could say that reproductive justice has gotten very good traction, at least in the people who are supposed to make allocations of humans, money, and time and space resources under the auspices of the federal government, they, they get it. You have seen reproductive justice be talked, out, talked about at the Super Bowl because Mary J. Blige did it in her you know, commercial specific to screening mammograms. So we're getting more and more traction around reproductive justice when the Dobbs versus Mississippi case, which uh, we saw from the Supreme Court, you know, the leaked documents that may overturn Roe. There was an op-ed written by Monica Simpson, the executive director of Sister Song in the New York Times, talking about why we need reproductive justice. So there have been different, very high level touch points. There was a piece in the Washington Post this past weekend mentioning reproductive justice, but it's not currently taught, um, at least comprehensively outside of either public health programs or uh, programs in obstetrics and gynecology. You will see it taught in some sociology or other academic institutions. Part of my uh, transition moving to the University of Washington is to really create reproductive justice informed content for nursing and public health learners at all levels. So the more that we, we talk about, a, a lot of people can say pro-life and pro-choice because that's been a, a product of a 40 year campaign yeah. to get to polarize people when we already know that the discussion around birth, abortion, parenting, surrogacy, infertility, adoption is way more complicated than that. I've conducted two studies and published them last year that show that more of us are in that mushy middle than are on the polar extremes of the abortion debate. The Pew NPR Trust uh, 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 survey that came out last week showed that you know, the majority of, a, of a United States citizens when surveyed support, you know, abortion rights, especially abortion early in pregnancy. So this idea that it's some polarized thing when the, the truth is it's actually more complicated. And so what the press misses, regardless of whatever you're talking about, um, is that we talk about the outcomes of pregnancy, but we don't talk about pregnancy itself, which is the condition. Right. A lot of people can spew how they feel about birth. They can spew how they feel about abortion. They can spew how they feel about adoption. They can spew what they want about parenting. But pregnancy is actually the condition. And so, however, because all pregnancies end. Right. But like, I mean, we, we are hearing some of that, like with Serena right. Williams, right? But it happened to her. Right. I think that's right. Yeah. When you think about Serena Williams and Beyonce and all the, you know, but uh, pregnancy sorry, is actually the condition. So as we think through that, we need to think about what are the supports that a, a robust social safety net could provide that would help us to make sure that whatever the pregnancy outcomes are, that they are good across the life course. So that's why we don't have paid family leave, right? That's why we have states that still haven't expanded Medicaid under the Affordable Care Act. That's why we actually don't have, you know, good postpartum support. It's part of the reason why we don't have, you know, we got breastfeeding and formula shortages right now. If we treated pregnancy 
with the reverence and respect that it deserves, regardless of how it ends, we would make different policy decisions about how to support pregnant capable people. So we've been- How is your work, I guess, as a, as a nurse and what you're doing yeah. and trying, you know, is, are they, you know, tied uh, and do you hope, you know, how, uh, how many years will it take us to get to under, since it was, you know, if the, the woman yeah. proposed that term, you know, they coined that yeah. term in 19, black woman coined that in 1994. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> check, this out. check this out. Let's, let's not act like we didn't have some wins, right? One of the interesting things about the pandemic is for years, people have been trying to move to telehealth or healthcare over the phone or the internet for years, right? And for the first time ever, we got an, uh, the Centers for Medicaid and Medicare Services, CMS, to agree to pay the same amount of money or to reimburse healthcare providers at the same rate that they would using telehealth platforms. And if you walked into your office, right, that should have been permanent because we right. have been working for years to get telehealth. Or despite national licensure, physicians and nurses, we all take the same licensure exam, regardless of what school you went to, regardless of what state you got your education in. But before the pandemic, the only place you could work across state lines, regardless of your life, like where you did your education was in the military. We could not send people to New York City or the Navajo Nation prior to the pandemic where there were healthcare worker shortages, but the pandemic rules were changed and allowed us to send people across state lines. That has never made sense to me. We all took the same licensure exam. So that right. is, and that's true for all health professions and for- Yeah, well, I believe so. But at least for nursing and medicine, that yeah. I know that's true, right? Yeah. We all take the yeah. same yeah. national licensing right. exam, but we couldn't cross state lines mm -hmm. to go provide care. Well, the pandemic right. changed that. That should stay permanent too. In my field, we saw all sorts of mutual aid and innovation happen. We saw people opening up maternity units and birth centers and hotels and other, we had drive-through baby showers, right? We had no touch access to sexually transmitted infections as well as medication abortion pills. All of that innovation stay. There's no reason we have to go back to the in-person appointment, right? So when we think about how long will it take, we've seen some innovations that were uh, exacerbated or sped up by the pandemic and that some of those things should remain permanent. The fact that you could get a no-touch sexually transmitted infection test, the fact that you could go in and get abortion pills without having to see it like a contactless interaction, some of that should stay permanent, right? What is I your, mean, you know, how, how much do you think, you know, where do we stand now in terms of that staying permanent? Well, okay, so let's get on why voting rights are a reproductive justice issue. Okay. So in the 116th Congress, right after they were sworn in, one of the first bills that was injured or a set of bills that were introduced by the Black Congressional Caucus and the Black Maternal Caucus, led by Rep. Alma Adams from North Carolina and Rep. Lauren Underwood, who happens to be a nurse, just like Cori Bush happens to be a nurse, they introduce what's called the Momnibus. And the Momnibus is this, this like omnibus bill that tries to fix many of the things that were wrong with our maternal health system. At the time, the 116th Congress, uh, when they introduced the Momnibus, it was nine bills, right? It got introduced a Tuesday before we went on national lockdown for COVID. So it went nowhere. It died on the House floor because there were pressing things that we need to deal with like a global pandemic. So when the 117th Congress um, was uh, sworn in three days before the insurrection, the first thing that the Congressional Black Caucus and the Black Maternal Caucus did was reintroduce the Momnibus, nine bills, but they added another three because the three bills were around COVID testing for pregnant people. It was around vaccines for pregnant people, and it was around data for pregnant people. The mom, but this set of bills looks at perinatal mental health, looks at substance use disorder, 
looked at uh, the better data needs we need or when uh, we have what's called maternal morbidity and mortality review committee. So those people, those brave souls who get together after every maternal death and they review all the charts and the medical records and try to find the root cause around that death and bringing in more money to bolster that. It was money to bring greater access to midwives and doulas because we know they improve health outcomes. New money for hospitals and healthcare institutions to train the next you know, level of providers in the perinatal workforce. Well, unfortunately, the omnibus was put into Bill Bet and Better, not the bipartisan infrastructure bill. And as we all know, Bill Bet Better is languishing. <laughs> it passed the House, but it didn't get through the Senate. So now they are trying to uh, bring out four of those bills, the substance use disorder one, the perinatal mental health one, the data and the maternal morbidity and mortality review. committee. They're trying to make those law using the budget reconciliation process. It's a Band-Aid, yeah. but all 12 of the omnibus bills would have been better. We can do this in our lifetime, right? I'm tired of people like kicking the can down the road and saying, oh, we've been waiting so long for changes in our systems and this and that. We actually could do this. So the reason that voting rights are reproductive justice issues is because momnibus should be the law of the land. The strategic investments we use make with public dollars to improve health outcomes, especially for reproductive capable people. I want to remind your listeners that prior to COVID-19, pregnancy and childbirth were the number one reasons why people in the United States were admitted to hospitals and or healthcare institutions. Let me say that again, right? We have 4 million births in the United States. 98% of births happen in hospitals and healthcare institutions. So prior to COVID-19, pregnancy and childbirth were the number one reasons why people were admitted to hospitals and healthcare institutions, right? These are the people who are brave enough to propagate our species during a global pandemic, they deserve reverence and they deserve, you know, the levers of the taxpayer dollars, because they are also taxpayers, even if you are poor, to be able to make these human investments to improve health outcomes. Well, if you have representatives who don't understand that, then our capacity to achieve reproductive justice is limited. I already said we still have 12 states that didn't expand Medicaid under the Affordable Care Act. And we already know insurance coverage as an intervention itself improves health outcomes. Okay. <laughs> right. right. So right. voting and the, rights. The, states are, the, the worst mortality rates for, for women are in the states that did not take, you know, that get less. You know, exactly. You can't get. Exactly. Yeah. And, and insurance coverage in and of itself is already known to improve health outcomes because people change their health care seeking behaviors when they have coverage. We have data that we published this in social science and medicine in 2018, right? When people have access to health insurance, they use it. And, and we can screen earlier, we can prevent conditions, we can manage hypertension and diabetes better because they have Coverage. That's why insurance coverage in and of itself is a intervention that improves health outcomes and moves us towards health equity. So again, why is that a reproductive justice issue? Well, if you don't have representatives who are willing to invest in the public health of their citizens, then they need to be voted out because you're never going to see improvements in reproductive health outcomes if we don't provide the policy tools that are necessary in order for people to optimize them. So I try to explain to people, and it's not just reproduction like sex organs and pregnancy. It's the reproduction of ideas. It's the reproduction of imagination. It's the reproduction of creativity. One of the things that I think the administration did poorly was not to understand that infrastructure is not just bridges and roads. It's the people who work on them. You can't change institutions if you don't support. It's humans, money, time, and space. Those are all resources. Those are all infrastructural needs. They didn't communicate that well to the public. I wish they had. They should have let me say it. 
<laughs> I'm with you. No. You are I, a great teacher. I can see you're a great teacher. Well, they should let me write those talking points. Because again, <laughs> like, you know, or even like, I mean, when you think about the ways in which we invest in the future, right? If we can send $40 billion to Ukraine to lift up you know, their citizens and to really provide them the tools that they need in order to be able to defend their country, we can fix ours, right? If we can see the humanity, you know, that's necessary in to investing in citizens in another country, we can do the same for our own. So, you know, again, <laughs> right, this is why we need to cancel student loan debt. Right. In your introduction of me, you you read the institutions that I went to. I have three degrees from public schools. I am currently a tenure professor at a public school. I am going to a public school. I was built. We can build others like me. But as long as we have people languishing with student loan debt, then we are strangling the innovation of our workforce. Right, we can make strategic investment. I, I had no student loan debt. I went to public schools. The taxpayers used to believe in public education. I was built. One of the reasons I can do all the work that I do as a nurse, as a public health professional, as a molecularly trained scientist, as somebody who can write and convey ideas is because the public trusted me and invested in the future. We can do that again. When I tell people I am the lone black tenured associate professor at that level at the University of California, San Francisco, we have 3,516 faculty. That's in a blue no, state. Incredible. Incredible yeah. statistic. Yeah. When I, when I, when I tell that to people, they look at me like, what Monica? Right. <laughs> so I, but I was built, we need just, to build, we need to build step, more of to step back a second, I think, you know, you wrote a, a medium piece where you said there are also, this is really interesting too, because, you know, in another, like, look at it, you know, you're, you said you're the, there are less than 1% of nurses who have uh, a PhD. PhD. Yes. Let me talk about nursing education and why this is so important. The public has been really kind to name us as the most trusted profession of the health professions, you know. Uh, for the last 20 years, the only time we did not receive this designation was in 2001, um, you know, after uh, the towers fell, right? So fire and police got that designation, right? Rightfully so. That said, you know, 88% of nurses have baccalaureate degrees or associate degrees in the United States. 88. 12% have advanced education, many at the master's level, some at the doctorate nursing practice level, and only 1% of nurses have PhDs. We are lucky if we graduate between 400 and 500 folks. And the reason this matters is not an elitist thing. It is a brain trust. I remind the, the listeners, the PhD is the unifying degree across all disciplines of the people who produce knowledge. We can conduct original research in order to be able to develop evidence for the you know, knowledge base that, that people use, whether you're in education or engineering or physics or nursing, right? We're the knowledge producers. We are the people that generate original research that provides the evidence for the things that we do, the things that we know and the things that we understand. So it matters that we only graduate between 400 or 500 PhDs every year because there's 596 accredited schools of nursing in the United States. Yeah. So where are we going to get our faculty from, right? The mm -hmm. mean age, at least when it was last collected, of faculty in schools of nursing, it's 56 years old. I'm 52. I was relatively young when I completed my PhD in nursing, right? Who's going to teach the next generation of people? That's why canceling student loan debt is a reproductive justice issue, <laughs> because it's not just that students are not getting educational exposure that they need in order to be able to advance not only their education, but their careers. But we also know that half of the professoriate are childbearing age individuals. So we have to create policies to make a professorial life be appealing to people who have young children. I mean, what was that in December of 2020 at the height of the pandemic? 
we saw how many, what percentage of women leave the workforce, right? And then almost 100% of them were black and brown women because we had caregiving responsibilities either to parents or children, right? We need a care economy that supports people who are childbearing families, but also people taking care of parents and other folks. Let me tell you a story about why canceling student loan debt is a reproductive justice issue. One of the moms that I interviewed for one of my research studies <clears throat> was taking care of her, her mother who had metastatic breast cancer. And she had an uneventful pregnancy. Um, unfortunately, she ended up having a, a C-section. This was her first child um, because her labor uh, stopped progressing. And this is a person because um, her mom had breast cancer before she got pregnant and it became metastatic that she was working in the gig eco economy. She was uh, driving for Lyft and Uber because, you know, that gave her the flexibility to allow her mother to take her, take her to all her appointments and all of those things. She's a primary caregiver. Well, of course, that meant that she didn't have employer sponsored health insurance because that's the number one people that way that people have insurance in the United States because we don't have a national health system. So she traded off the convenience of gig work to be able to take care of her mom and now her new baby. But then she didn't have employer sponsored health insurance. Ten days after her C-section, she was back sitting eight hours a day in her car driving for Lyft and Uber to generate income. Right. The number one reason we know that 40 percent of maternal deaths happen in the postpartum period. And most of those are associated with some cardiovascular events, right? Uh, stroke, blood clot. She's sitting in a car with an abdominal surgical wound, driving eight hours a day. That's the last thing she should be doing. <laughs> but did she, you know, did she you know, make it? Did, did, she's did, fine. Did, did, but I'm just saying, if we want yeah. to, to change the tide around maternal morbidity and mortality in the United States, if we wanted to do that, we know 40% of those deaths happen in the postpartum period after somebody has a baby. If we wanted to cut that to almost zero, we would have paid family leave. People could stay at home. They'd be paid to stay at home. Maternal child bonding, lactation and breastfeeding, changing the relationship with whoever the co-parent is, because that changes too. Adapting their other children to this new life. I mean, there's all this stuff that happens in the postpartum period. People just think you have a baby and then done, bang, we're done. No. Right. And if you happen to be in that sandwich generation where you're also caring for aging parents, we are being disrespectful to childbearing families by not providing paid family leave. Right. And if you have student debt, that doesn't get canceled or paused just because you have pregnancy and postpartum. Right. So it, it is we would rethink our systems if we were really serious if in wanting to see improved health outcomes because we would connect all of these dots together right your student loan payments like don't go away just because you're on pregnancy disability or just because you had a baby right i mean so we we could rethink all yeah. of this we wanted to think structurally and get out of our own way around sort of some of the politics um when we think about health outcomes so to me, that's why canceling student loan debt is a reproductive justice issue, at least for poor people, because then mm -hmm. they're not re-exposing themselves to the conditions that would cause them to have increased risk for maternal morbidity and mortality, because they wouldn't be trying to generate income in a capitalist environment that doesn't pro provide them or afford them any postpartum coverage or any expansion under the ACA. Well, I think, you know, you have you have all these big picture ideas, which are great. Um, thank you. Um, I'm going to push the rest of society to appreciate the fact that despite the fact that we're, we're, we're always sold uh, this idea that we're polarized, actually, we can all come together and agree about some things and, and make change. I know people hate it, but incremental change in a democracy is part of the process. We want to all swallow a pill and have this all be different and transform. But the truth of the matter is there is a lot of roll up your sleeves, hard work that needs to happen at the regional grassroots community and national levels. And that's why voting rights are reproductive justice issue. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Can't Scott will never stop saying that. <laughs> uh, absolutely. I uh, agree with you. 
uh, what can we, you know, what can we do now? Like last week I had on my show, I had Dr. Uh, Sophia Yen, mm -hmm. founded Pandia Health. Yep. And uh, Dr. Uh, Nehal, who uh, is a... I'm brave. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. I know both so, of them. Yeah. And so they're, they're, they were talking a little bit about you know, what femtech can do and, uh, you know, that it's usually seen as something that is, is for privileged people, but, but really in the way that you're also talking about with, um, telehealth visits, you know, that's what Pandia health can do, yeah. you know, for $20 a year, they're saying, uh, you don't have to go find a doctor, you know, find, you know, yeah. uh, 50 miles away, you know, you can pay us 20 and, and we'll be with you for the whole year. If you have any yeah. issues, you come to us. You know, yeah. provided you know you submit you know some documentation about blood pressure yeah. and your history. So, you know what you know how how important are those efforts, uh, aside from voting, right? To yeah. Yeah. where we oh. can go if we do face uh, the overturn of uh, Roe versus Wade. Well, I think tech solution, you know, I've been relatively ambivalent about tech solutions. And, and don't get me wrong, I, you know, I lived in the San Francisco Bay Area for almost 30 years. So I, I am a early adopter of tech. I think tech is really important. That said, I was pretty stunned when uh, Serena Williams did invest in mommy, the mommy app, um, only because that would have never fixed the fact that a nurse didn't listen to her. Right. Tech solutions still need to have humans and intervention. So for me, it's I've learned it's a both and it's not an either or. Okay. So we need technological solutions to help us continue to document and map, you know, where there is need because we've had closures of abortion clinics. We've had closures of rural obstetric units. All of those things are related, by the way. Um. And so I do think it's a both and it's not. And, and I, I get nervous when people start talking about as tech as the panacea of things. You still need reform, you know, at the very foundational level. We can't also deprive uh, brick and mortar institutions of their responsibility to mitigate this as well. So I feel like it's a both and one of the studies that we have currently under review, some of the data that we found is. Uh, black and queer folks really liked uh, tech solutions and telehealth solutions because uh, they had to experience everyday discrimination and racism going into the doctor's office. So using telehealth, they didn't have to deal with any of that. So they didn't have to deal with, you know, either comments from, you know, staff around where partners were or assumptions that people were making or having their, you know, concerns dismissed. They didn't have to deal with any of that. So people actually really did appreciate uh, telehealth and, and other kinds of technologically ba based platforms. So I think it's super important that as we think through, it's a both and, and it's not a one size fit all, right? I know in my program, uh, we had to send out devices and data plans to some of the uh, Black women-led community-based organizations. And we had to set up a COVID-19 birth worker relief fund because a lot of the clients and some of the doulas and other birth workers um, and even some of the abortion doulas, they didn't have devices that could support telehealth, right? We have people who have broadband issues. That's why broadband is a reproductive justice issue, right? It's also an infrastructure issue. We as the public- It, it is. I mean, you know, I, I was doing, yeah. Investments yeah, you know. in that, taxpayer dollars, right? Mm -hmm. It's a utility and should be treated as such. So I feel very, very strongly that and, and we can be creative. That's the other thing, right? We don't have to be reactive. When we're thinking about birth and abortion and contraception and all of the different things that any person needs across their reproductive life course, we can be intensely creative about how we design services or redesign services such that, you know, we can optimize our workforce. I'll give you a perfect example. In those states where, uh, when Roe falls, uh, we have automatic trigger bans in those 29 states. I need somebody to guarantee that that workforce will not be in an unemployment line. I want to see folks say those people will be guaranteed jobs either in telehealth platforms or in other clinical states that somebody will put up some money to relocate those folks. We should not lose that expertise. Right. There are things that we can be doing right now, making sure that our you know, emergency department and labor and delivery nurses really are trained really, really well you know, across the reproductive spectrum. 
We can also talk to healthcare workers and say, you do not have to be deputized as wards of the state to be, you know, calling police and locking up our patients. That violates all of our codes of ethics. So, you know, as you think through, as we think through these, these very fast changing times, and as we think about the, uh, you know, space where we're at, we can actually get creative and also think about what are the other mutual aid networks that we can be leveraging? How can we really think about getting folks the care that they need? What uncanny partnerships do we need to put into place? I can't believe I have had multiple discussions, you know, with hospitals and health systems who want to be able to prepare and prepare their staff. I was just at the American College of Nurse Midwives meeting in Chicago, Illinois. We did the first ever hands-on abortion skills workshop for midwives. We had a waiting list of people who wanted to get in on our pre-session. People who how wanted- many, How many people took the-, took the We had course. enough space for 30, right? N- clearly not enough because we had a wait list, right? So when we think about people who want to be activated in this moment, You know, how can we get people information and skill? That's the other thing. Even if folks don't want to engage around, you know, the abortion debate or, you know, contraception, family planning, whatever, at least use your voice to get folks to fact-based information. There's a lot of misinformation out right now, right? We have a lot of lies and Nazis and bots and trolls and all these other folks. If you're not going to, you know get involved in the discussion, at least direct people to evidence-based, science-based information, right? I and, say and you, 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 your, your face was on like six billboards, I think. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Right. Talking exactly. about fact-based. Yes. Yeah. Because when, before he became the Department of Health and Human Services Secretary, uh, Javier Becerra was the uh, attorney general in California. And he argued a case in front of the Supreme Court where my work was cited. It was called Nifla versus Becerra because he was trying to defend the Reproductive Fact Act, which in California was a letter based system where clinics would have to identify whether or not they offered clinical services or not similar to the letter based systems we see in restaurants. Right. In terms of cleanliness. And it's been cleared by the public health department. Right. Because there are. Uh, pregnancy help centers or crisis pregnancy centers that mislead patients that basically try to talk them out of, you know, abortion or talk them out of contraception. And these mostly, but not all, are religiously affiliated uh, institutions that are backed by either the Catholic Church or evangelicals. And he was arguing that we should have a way to identify who are clinical providers of care and who are not. And he, we lost that case. But I was on those billboards in advance of his arguments because I wanted people to be able to use their phone to hit a QR code to know where the closest licensed clinical provider was near them. So, yes, I took a huge gamble as a pre-tenure assistant professor and put my face on billboards after Neil Gorsuch was appointed to the Supreme Court in support of A.G. Basara's work in trying to protect access to fact-based information. Yes, I did that. I was on abortion-related billboards in the state of California to be able to help amplify, you know, his messaging, as well as to pilot whether or not we could bring back public service announcements, because I'm old enough to remember those, using billboards across the country. After I did that, 10 other reproductive justice and reproductive rights organizations put up billboards in 18 other states. So I'd like to say I brought back the public service announcement. <laughs> <laughs> you you put your you know you put your face and your feet where your your head is and you know your heart. So that's well, you know, I stand with the people that we serve, and I'm never wrong. Right, I stand with the public. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I stand with people who seek who need reproductive health care across their trajectory, regardless of what that care looks like. My dissertation was in oncology genomics. I studied tumor markers of ovarian cancer. I stood with ovarian cancer patients too. You know, for me, my work is more about, I take it very seriously as a nurse that I took an oath to serve the public, that I took an oath to provide the best science 
and the heart and art of nursing. I, I take that very seriously. I came up and trained with nurses side by side in 1988, the last time we had a global pandemic, right? I have been through HIV, H1N1, Zika, Ebola, SARS, MERS, right? This isn't my first go around in an, a deadly infectious disease agent where yeah. nurses have been called upon to serve the public. So for me, you know, I have learned that it is my job to make sure that people get fact-based information and they get good care regardless of the care that they're seeking. Okay. So for me, it, it, it matters. And I take it very, very seriously. And I take it very personally. That said, I always want to nuance and trouble discussions and leave people like guessing and thinking because that's what we do as a human species. I've never been pregnant. I have no idea what I would do if I had to make a pregnancy related decision. I'm glad I don't have to because I completed menopause during COVID-19. <laughs> okay. People make all sorts of assumptions about each other because of the work that we do, right? So and people, I wanna, most people assume you're a mother? They either assume I'm a mother or they assume I will have an abortion. Okay. And I don't know that I would do either. Okay. Right? And we need to have those kinds yeah. of complicated narratives. You mm -hmm. ask what the media could do, what the press could do. Mm -hmm. We need to reject the false binary or the false dichotomy you know, that are the nice sound bullet points. It's more complicated than that. Okay. And given all that, did you, what did you, when you were a little girl, I, I like oh, to yeah. ask people this, you know, what did you want to be? Did you know? Oh yeah, absolutely. This is a fun story. So I was a born a preemie in 1969. So all the work that I do is personal. And at that time, the infant mortality statistics in the state of New Jersey, where I, I uh, was born, uh, 16 per 100,000 infants died. And the number one cause of infant mortality to this day remains prematurity, being born too soon. So I was a preterm birth baby in 1969. Birthday was supposed to be on uh, Valentine's Day. It's so on New Year's Eve. So, you know, I spent a lot of time with hospitals, healthcare institutions, nurses. And so at eight years old, I marched into my parents' living room and I told them that if I survived the next set of tests and all the other things that, that I was going to be a nurse. And I said this despite the fact that there was nobody in my family at that time who worked in healthcare. So I declared I was going to be a nurse at 17 because my birthday was, you know, you used to make you wait to go to school. You had to be mm -hmm. five in kindergarten. Well, that happened after I was born, right? So I went to, I went to kindergarten for I graduated at 17 and, and I only applied to one nursing school in the country and I got in the one nursing school that I wanted to go into in the country. And our class was the only to graduate with a hundred percent pass rate for that national licensure exam the year I graduated. And I have never done anything else for pay as an adult. Something to be proud of and thank you for your well, service. It's a gift. I, it's a gift to be able to take care of families. It's a gift to be able to, to be with people and to provide them care with dignity. It is a gift. And I never take that for granted. I meet strangers all the time and, you know, I can see their, their naked body, right? It's a very <laughs> fascinating way to live as a servant. I came up during HIV before we even had universal precautions where you gown and you put gloves on, right? Yeah. That happened in my lifetime. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. to me, it, it's always been prescient and obvious to me that service to the public is a real gift. I mean, I, I can't tell you that, that a needle stick could have killed me when I was training, right? Because we didn't know a lot about each other, just like COVID right now, right? Yeah. We didn't know a lot about it. Yeah. And the nursing professors that I work with, demanded that we work with them side by side. And I asked them why. And they said, Monica, if we all die, you know, during this, during this HIV epidemic, at least we have trained the next generation of people to know what it means to care for the public. We want good care if we get sick. That's why we're here doing this with you. So that's why I don't have a lot of, you know, patience for people who have disrespected nurses, healthcare workers, and other essential workers in this moment. This is why I unapologetically call for COVID mitigation strategies. This is why I'm continuing to mask. This is why I test every three days. 
This is why I continue to do, like, as long as we can't suppress community spread around COVID, you know, the majority of the deaths that we have had have been black and brown people, right? We can't care for each other anymore. We can't protect each other anymore. I think we can, right? This politicization is a decision. It's a choice. We can choose differently. And I need more people to believe that. So, you know, as far as I'm concerned, I, like I said, I was built. Public education made me, you know, the people I serve every time I, t I learn a different lesson from everybody I take care of. So to me, all I want to be able to do is instill into the future, you know, that we can make this all different. It doesn't have to be like this. And we need a collective group of courageous people. As one of my mentors, you know, um, Dr. Keith Yamamoto says to me, we need a coalition of the willing to be mm -hmm. courageous. Mm -hmm. I want to be in that coalition and I hope others will join us. No, well, thank you. You're a fierce advocate. Uh, why did you choose or did you, was it part of the, your game plan to, to become a master's, to go for a master's and to get a PhD? You know, at what well, point did you? <laughs> I like, again, I like to be complicated and I like to debunk myths for people. I'm not the first Dr. McLemore in my family. That's my sister. Right. So, you know, my father, before he became an Ivy League educated judge, he was a lawyer. And before that, he was a Marine, Semper Fi. And before that, you know, he was the first black state trooper in the state of New Jersey. So I come from a family of, you know, longtime educated people. I advanced my master's degree because I knew that I wanted to teach. And in order to teach in the state of California, you have to have a master's degree. When I got to my master's degree, it was really hilarious because I figured out I didn't want to be a clinician. I took a course in epidemiology, which is the study of diseases and population. I fell in love. I was like, oh, I need public health. I need public health, right? And um, I we were mapping the human genome at the time that I started my master's degree. And I realized I would never do the kind of work that I wanted to do on, on, unless I advanced my education. So I finished my master's degree in May of 2002, and I started the PhD program in September of 2002. I went straight through. Okay. So. Okay. And, <laughs> uh, do, you know, with your advocacy and your view of, you know, how things could work, mm -hmm. do, you f do you feel, and, and as you now are teaching at University of California, but as you mm -hmm. told me in a little note, you said, well, no, I'm not stopping teaching at University of California. You're yeah. going to teach in, 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 in San Francisco, University of uh, California, San well, Francisco, and I have the a, University of, of Washington. Exactly. Of and Michigan. I have a huge research portfolio, um, millions of dollars that sit at the University of California, San Francisco. So I'm going to rejoin the adjunct series um, so that I can continue to conduct that research, I'm probably going to set up some satellites of those programs at the University of Washington. It's really important that we disassociate ourselves from this institutional affiliation piece. Let me tell you why. Nursing is shared work, right? So people go into hospitals and healthcare institutions for nursing care, right? Because otherwise you would go to your doctor's office if you wanted to see a physician, right? People come into hospitals and healthcare institutions for 24-hour nursing care. We do shift-based work. I was a night nurse. I work from 11 o'clock at night until 7.30 in the morning. And we hand off to other nurses because it's 24-hour nursing care. Nursing is shared work. So it's, it's in direct opposition to how we think about academia. Academia is like that expert sage on the stage, one person, blah, blah, blah. Nursing is shared work. I always say, had we brought nursing to academia instead of the other way around, we would have figured out how to get multiple people as professors like we did during the human genome project. I mean, you had, you know, hundreds of thousands of scientists around the world trying to map the human genome. People finished PhDs and postdocs. We figured out data use agreements and all this group work, <laughs> right? So it doesn't really matter what institution I'm at in terms of really trying to do my work because what I'm really trying to do is something different. I am trying to create nursing within academia such that our work can be 
amplified systematically, the impact of our work can actually be aligned with broader issues. So, you know, yes, I'm going to return to the adjunct series and be a tenured person at the dub, but I don't see those two things as ex mutually exclusive, nor do I see them as distinct because- I mean, I ask you a question. Yeah. One of the things Sherpa. I read in some, of you, in some of the background was that there was an exchange or, you know, there was some people, some scholars, some white uh, doctors and nurses who came out and talked about reproductive rights, you know, re reproductive justice. Yeah. Yeah. There was a concept analysis that was published in the journal Public Health Nursing where our all white team decided to write up a, a concept analysis, which is a, it's a way of um, analyzing a construct. Um, and they, you review all the published literature and basically you come up with this meta uh, document or meta assessment around where reproductive justice has been infused either into public health nursing or both. And they only looked at the published peer review literature, like their methods were all over the map and it was, it was, it, and it remains difficult. And I'm really lucky because I reached out to the senior author and we've been in conversations about publishing pieces together and why we can use this as a teachable moment um, to really get people to understand that reproductive justice is a really different way of thinking about work and to exclude like the gray literature that's not published, to not include art, which is an essential component of reproductive justice and joy right, to only look at one facet of science was a real mistake because reproductive justice is bigger than that. So when we start to think about the, the marriage or the art and the practice or the science and, the, you know, they have to be wedded together in order for us to imagine different futures and for us to have, you know, multiple ways of appreciating and understanding and experiencing the world. So, you know, conflict does not have to be, um, you know, negative. Yeah. That yeah. experience really came out of this. Oh, yeah. I mean, we were able to talk with the senior author. I assembled, you know, uh, 30 scholars around the country to write a response. Um, we are really thinking through a shared piece together in terms of how do you not co-opt the work of other folks? How do you not parachute into a field that's not yours? My, my good collaborator, Dr. L. Lett, she's uh, coined the term, how do you not become a health equity tourist, right? How do you not, you know, claim or deign to have expertise that you don't have? Right. This is the problem that has been created by the machinery of science, but it's not a science problem per se. It's the it's the perverse incentive of always wanting to have the next best grant, the next best paper, the next. That's how that's the administration of science. The science in and of itself, the curiosity behind what's driving those questions. But you got to have the right team. You got to have the right, you know, uh, members who can assist you with the work. You can't just you know, put out a neutered version of something when there's a rich literature that exists because you wanted to, you know, join the conversation. You got to do the homework. Okay. So, yeah, I, I have been looking at new ways of, of conflict resolution and management because, again, reproductive justice principles say that we can't throw anybody away. That's not okay, yeah. right? Yeah. So again, RJ is, is a bigger framework. It is a different way of thinking and being in the world. And quite frankly, because it's grounded in human rights, nobody is disposable. Mm -hmm. We're just not. Well, I hope, I hope uh, this show is, is, I'm understanding a lot more listening to you. <laughs> I could talk um, about this all day. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I tell people we know more about Johnny Depp and Amber, like their, their trial than we do about like the basic fundamental principles, principles that could transform our democracy. Yeah. I'm one of those people who just, you know, shuts it out because I say like, what is this? You know, it's always coming up. We need like everybody things. activated. That's <laughs> the thing. That's the thing I'm trying to get people to understand that if we activate everybody with their unique gifts and talents, right, we could unleash the creativity of humanity.
that's what is doom and gloom and all this other stuff that people are contributing. It's not helpful. I get that people need to do that. And I sort of feel right. like, like folks need to go work that out in therapy. But 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 with a public front right now, what the future workforce needs to understand is this doesn't have to be this way. We can make it all different. We need to be courageous in the work that we want to be able to do. And we need language. We need processes to bring people along. We should be using social media to simulate different kinds of conversations with people. Meanwhile, you still got novices yelling back and forth to each other. Mm -hmm. Right? Well, yeah. Well, I'm trying to do this show to, to bring I people. I see. That's why I agreed to participate. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to, um, Dr. Yen, who was my guest last week. Yeah. Um, she was in, you must I I still see you know each now. other, but uh, she... Uh, she made a comment, we need to vote for good people. We need good people to run for office. We need to hold our electeds responsible. So. I agree. And quite <laughs> frankly, I would love to see a new cadre of people who know they only want to run for one term because they know they're going to be disruptive as hell. Right? Uh, like, I would like no. to see just like, you, you know what I mean? It would be nice to see a cohort of folks that's uh -huh. just like, we're not in this for the long run. We are here for transformation. Right? I do toy with the idea of running for office, you know, at some point in my lifetime. I think I should probably join like the federal government at some point first to be able to see what what work is like. But yeah, I play with ideas all the time because, you know, true to nursing, I try to always remember to go where I'm needed, mm -hmm. not 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 just where it's comfortable for me to be at. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. So I think her comment is on point. Mm -hmm. I think it's on point. Well, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Yan, for joy, for uh, listening in. Yeah. Uh, and I think uh, somebody I know in Tallahassee, uh, Paula Kiger, uh, mm -hmm. had made a comment, uh, so many nurses in our family and we want to support them. Agreed. Yeah. Agreed. I mean, the truth of the matter is nursing is an incredible profession and we have been just so disrespected over the COVID vaccine or the whole COVID pandemic, whether it was lack of access to PPE in the beginning, you know, all the way through, you know, the different, you know, mess around vaccines. I really hope that people understand that what you're watching play out is a, you know, precipice of change. And I have never done anything for pay as an adult. I would never want to do anything else for pay as an adult. And I hope if you're considering nursing, um, that you will seriously, seriously seek out mentors who can help you on your path because we need more people to be willing to care for the public. I think that that creating a care economy, creating a care environment, we could fix this polarized country if nurses just decided that we do what we do behind closed doors in hospitals and healthcare institutions every day. So that's one of the reasons why I try to be very public about not just my scholarship, but also being a nurse. Because our skill set, I think we could nurse the nation, which is, I think, exactly what we need. But we I can't do that. it. I love that idea. We can't do it alone. <laughs> Amanda Gorman's going to write about that, right? <laughs> I hope uh, poets do and musicians yeah. too. <laughs> we need them right now more than yeah. ever. Uh, question. I, yep. you know, this, this hashtag started because I put out a question, you know, who are your three women to follow? Oh yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh shoot. I, three, I can give you 30. <laughs> <laughs> <I'm sure. laughs> well, let's start with me. And you know, when I, if I put, when I put this out, I'd love to yeah. hear from, you know, we'll, we'll get a, you know, a thousand. Yeah. Going. The first person I would name is Dr. Ifenwa Asiyadu. Uh, Dr. Asiaru is a colleague and collaborator of mine at the University of California, San Francisco. She is also the past chair of the California Breastfeeding Coalition. She has had some really great um, and important insights, not just around the infant formula, you know, shortage, but why that's a reproductive justice issue. And, you know, she does really, really great and incredible work in the lactation space. I also would uh, suggest uh, Dr. Jamila Taylor, who I also just recently named as a associate editor uh, at Health Equity. She's currently at the Century Foundation and has been doing incredible analyses and research around expansion of Medicaid 
and particularly Medicaid gaps and Medicaid in the postpartum period. She's done a lot of um, uh, writings that's very specific to the cost savings as well as the life savings that we could achieve if we were to appropriately fund uh, Medicaid and have other insurance plans uh, have coverage in the postpartum period. And then the last person is my good friend, Dr. Karen Scott. Dr. Karen Scott uh, is the chief and principal uh, CEO of Birth and Cultural Rigor. She is transforming quality improvement uh, in hospitals and healthcare institutions. And she has created um, a, an incredible patient reported uh, experience measure of, of their births and their pregnancy care uh, in the in-hospital inpatient setting with a cultural anthropologist, Dr. Donna Ayn Davis. Their work um, is going to change hospital-based quality improvement and really, really get us to some of the pieces that you talked about in terms of what are the new indicators that we need in order to see improved health outcomes. So those are the three people that I would say, but there are many, many others that I could like lift up and I'll be happy to put them out on social media uh, once I go to Twitter after this. Oh, fantastic. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, before we end, I'll, I'll ask you, I don't know, you know, uh, I know you've said so much, but, you know, any final thoughts for, for people watching? Well, I mean, I think, you know, just a reminder that all of this can be different. I, I think about when Glenda the Good Witch you know, looked at Dorothy and, and told her that she always had the power to go home, right? I mean, so I, all of this could be different and I need more people to believe that. And I need people to act like that's true because then we will activate a whole new way of thinking about the current environment in which we find ourselves in. Okay. Well, thank you. I, I hope to get out your, your, hope more people will see this if they, you know, I hope people will uh, follow and write write any comments. Uh, and I'd love to, uh, you know, we have people comment afterwards and, and to tell yeah. me more. I'm so. happy to continue this conversation on social media. I am Macklemore MR everywhere, LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, I'm myself everywhere. And so please, if I didn't, you know, get to your question or if something comes up afterwards, y'all can hit me up on social media. Okay. Well, thank you so much for joining for joining me, Dr. Um, Macamora. I'm so uh, honored. So, and thank, and thank you. And Rose, so much. Rose is my middle name. So oh. we're gonna be BFFs now. So. <laughs> well, awesome. I'm just gonna say a few words. If you can just hang for a minute, and I'll be yeah. back with you for in a second. So, I just want to uh, thank everyone for joining me. It was really a pleasure and uh, an honor to speak to uh, Dr. Macamora. Uh, and I will be back next month with another show. I'd love to hear uh, your ideas on on guests that you'd love to you'd like me to talk to. Uh, so uh, just uh, DM me uh, or uh, send me a note. Uh, and I just want to uh, mention my uh, I'm part of a group called Digimentors, uh, and uh, they have a show this Sunday coming up with. The uh, uh, Sri Srinivasan um, will be talking to Amy Versha, uh, at the who is a travel editor of the New York Times. Uh, so that should be a great show. And again, um, I won't say prayers because that's been misused too much. Uh, but thoughts are with the people uh, suffering from this terrible uh, shooting in Texas. Uh, so uh, anyway. Thank you so much for joining me. Uh, I'll see you next time.